Welcome, welcome. Morning. Good morning. Hi, Alex. How are you? I'm doing good. Good. There we go. It's my mirror. <laughs> I know. That's well, wow, super exciting to see everyone. We have a new platform in the Zoom world. Yay. All right. Let us all know where you're coming in from because people are coming in. Dran Reb. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Cool. We got Michigan, Seattle. All right, so who here is interested in DIY in their own home? Put DIY in the chat. Or if you're looking to get a builder to build it, put builder in the chat. Oh, we got some DIYers here. Woo! It's still happening out there. <laughs> Yay. If you're looking to buy it from a builder, let us know. Maybe a mix. Oh, I love those. Hybrid. Smart, right? Shell and DIY. Yes, let them do the framing, the electrical, maybe the plumbing, all yes. the fun things. <laughs> Not sure. Good, good. You're you're researching. That's great. Uh, who here is a manufacturer or a builder yourself or looking to become a builder? Anyone out there in that position? Because I know we've got all people from all over the globe. True, we got Ontario in the house, Victoria, Spain. Yep, I knew the globe would be represented. UK, UK. look and become a builder. Oh, I think this is so. I think we're pretty much set with the people that we've got here. Let me share my screen. Um, Perfect. and uh, how about you introduce yourself, Alex, and I'll introduce myself. All right, so my name is Alex Ontiveros. I am one of the co founders of Pacific West Tiny Homes. Uh, we've been doing certification for uh rvs and park models for about 40 years and we started working in the tiny home industry about eight years ago we apply the same codes currently to tiny homes on wheels or movable tiny homes as we do to those other two products the rv code and the park model to make sure that they are safe and permittable in some jurisdictions uh, to make sure you'll see it all in the presentation but uh, to make sure that you have good resale values since it's something that we are now seeing and to ensure the safety of your of yourself or of your customers if you're a builder looking to make the homes for somebody else. And hi everyone, I'm Lindsay, the tiny home lady. I actually, my husband and I went tiny in 2017 and found our builder and our builder went out of business in the middle of the build. And one of the things that we were so excited to ask for is that they would pay for certification. And that's how Alex and I met when I was scrambling around thinking, I know I wanted it certified. I learned that from an event that I went to and Alex saved the day. And he really taught me a lot about it. And since then, uh, we work together. I'm an affiliate with Pacific West Tiny Homes, offering both DIY and manufacturer programs. And the presentation we have for you, which is the four benefits of tiny homes, is really going to help you. Actually, four benefits of certifying tiny homes mm -hmm. is going to really help guide you to understanding more about certification. So, uh, one other thing, uh, for the last few years, the Go Tiny Showcase that we've taken to many events has featured Pacific West Tiny Homes. So not only do we have the sticker on the side of our tiny home, have we worked with DIYers and also builders, but we've also been taking Pacific West around the country wherever Alex is not able to go to, uh, and it's been really exciting to share the good news of certification. Okay, so as we dive in, what does this mean? All this ANSI NFPA, Alex, tell us. So ANSI and NFPA are two different ways to certify tiny homes on wheels. We currently base the certification that the customer needs on the size of the tiny home that they want to build or on the specific permitting and uh, legislation that they have in their area. Uh, one of those things, uh, one of those examples is, let's take California. If you want to be able to park in certain places like City of LA, you need to have a certified unit. Um, the seal that you can see on your screen right now is what tells the jurisdictions that the units that they are allowing and that they are permitting are actually certified. So we have 
in a sense, acted as the building inspector for that specific jurisdiction. And I do want to point out, it's taken me probably years to understand the difference of ANSI or NFPA. And I think I've asked you like five times, Alex. Yes. My understanding, anything eight and a half, um, eight and a half or less, which most likely it's going to be eight and a half, or mm -hmm. less than 13 and a half, or less than 320 square feet, certifies to more of an NFPA standard. Yes. If you go above any of those, then you get into the ANSI park model standard. And this over here will change. It will say certified to NFPA or ANSI, whichever one you're certifying for. Correct. Yeah, the biggest difference on the certifications will be the size of the unit. Like you said, the width of eight and a half, the height of 13 and a half, um, and the square footage. And mostly it's to differentiate between the units that are road legal and the ones that require permits for movement. Um, we do have a hard limit of 400 square feet, and that's measured from outside corner to outside corner of the unit. And those are the units that will be an ANSI unit. Uh, you can exceed those parameters, the eight and a half and the 13 and a half, and that will depend actually on where you are building it or where you're intending to park it, how big you can go as far as the width and the height of the unit. But you do have that limit of 400 square feet. Yes, for both. Good one. Did that help everyone to understand different ANSI or NFPA? So for you DIYers out there that already said DIY, will you build to NFPA or ANSI? Just put N in the comment or A or question mark if you're not quite sure, right? For some of you that want to go 10 wide, you're going to go to the ANSI. For those of you that want to go eight and a half or get, you know, probably N. Okay, great. This is good. A little test on that. Okay. So now we get into the fun part. What's the benefits of certification? For me, it was making sure it was built safely, right? We went from a builder that finished our home, not quite well. We had some plumbing challenges. We had electrical stuff big time. We were also doing solar and we wanted someone else to check the work that they had done. And then of course we had to hire the plumber and the electrician to fix the problems and we had Alex's access. So that was really critical because when you close up a wall, you don't get to see what's behind the, the wall. So Alex, maybe you have some story, a story to share about a home being built safely or maybe one that wasn't so built safely. Yeah, so built safely. I mean, when we get involved in the house building, we usually look at your at how you're doing your wiring, which is one of the things that, that are the most important during the certification process. Um, houses that have already been built, we really can't tell what's behind those walls. So the only choice that we have at that point is either you have pictures of how things were done and you have testing information from something that an electrician or somebody else did, or you have... Uh, or you have to tear out your walls, which is something that people don't really like. So, no. And a, this is a really important thing. When do you certify? When you start your project or in the middle or after? Yes. Uh, which one? Start, what do you guys think? Do you start, do you, do you engage Alexa services to DIY certification? Start, yes, and not in the middle, not after. You literally start, your very first imagery that you do with the video is you'll go to the VIN number and then you'll go to your trailer lights. If you're doing NFPA, you will show the trailer lights blinking, working the whole thing. If you do it to an ANSI, usually you'll have a professional transport doing 10 wides, bigger homes, and they'll bring their magnetized lighting and you don't need to show lights, but your trailer is your starting point. So if you're already like, building the walls and running electrical, you're far past the point where you wanted to get Alex engaged. So, all right. Um, and what we'll do is we'll keep going down and I'm gonna be tracking the chat because I see some questions here. So as you have questions, put them in the chat, we'll scroll back and uh, we'll keep the conversation moving. And that mm -hmm. way we'll wrap up with Q and A. So next one, placement. Why is this such a benefit for certification when it regards placement of a tiny home? Well, mostly because, uh, as I mentioned, there are some jurisdictions that will allow you to park and permit a unit as long as it has been certified. Uh, once you know where your tiny home is going to go or where you intend to put your tiny home, you want to make sure that you talk to your jurisdiction and see if you will be, which certification they will allow for permitting. 
that's uh, that's probably one of the biggest biggest reasons for the placement and the certification. The other one is RV parks. We we said placement here. We could say RV parks are getting more savvy to making sure tiny home communities absolutely will want to make sure it's certified uh, because it makes sure that that home is going to be safe. Here's the thing. If your home floods, your home floods. If your home mm. catches on fire, it can catch other homes on fire. So exactly. making sure, especially with regards to what we do with electrical, um, you know, we'll dive a little bit more into the different categories that's going to be certified to, uh, but there is an actual test called the high pot dielectric test that makes sure that the wires in the rough in and also after you put in the cabinets and all the nails have gone in the wall, then nothing happened with that little insulative property around that electrical wire so that you avoid a fire potential hazard. Uh, this is a great one. This is our tiny home that is certified. In fact, there's the little sticker right there. Um, we need a new one, Alex. <laughs> it's gotten a little sun baked. He actually has beautiful um, tags, but this is the one that shows to everyone, whether it's an RV park, the permitting department, you name it, that this home has been certified. And um, why is this so important again, Alex, for resale value? Because now you have a lot of people, um, you know, two years ago, we didn't have a, a resale market. Even last year, we struggled to find a lot of uh, homes that were being used and somebody was upgrading to a new one. But now when you look at places like tiny house listings, they have a category that, that specifies whether they have that certification or not. Because people are now looking to see if you can, uh, where you can put that house. I just grabbed this picture today, this morning. So there we go. The very top, this is right at the very top of their page. You know, here's one, here's another one. And this one says certified in the name or in the title. It doesn't even get the word tiny in there. So they're really putting that forward to say, look, we built this safely. Someone else has checked on it, all the things. Um, any builder that you work with that doesn't certify, run, don't walk. <laughs> just Okay, so another benefit that's happening, um, you know, a lot of people want to get their homes financed. How many of you in the chat want financing? Just put F, F some, some portion, even if it's not the whole amount. Some portion of that. Yep, we've got some financiers out there. So one of the biggest challenges to get financing from traditional, or I should say from some of the finance companies like 21st Mortgage, you probably won't be able to DIY. Um, that's just the thing where they actually require it from a builder. So if that meets your needs, like, hey, I want it financed and I want it from a builder, great. Then it'll already come with the requirements of being certified. Mm -hmm. But insurance is actually something, Alex, share with us a little bit more. Have you heard anything about insurance companies requiring it or especially finance, other stories like that? So finance companies will require it a lot more than, than insurance companies, but you still have... In some situations, uh, insurance companies will actually offer discounts for a house that has been certified because they have more of an assurance that the house was built correctly. Um, the, if nobody looked at the build and they don't know what's behind the walls, it becomes a liability for them, which is basically what everybody is trying to avoid with the certification process. You know, we're What I tell my builders is we are the insurance before you have to call the insurance companies. Right, right. Yeah, you ensure that the electrical wires are not going to blow up in, in smoke. Remember, we're putting fire in a wire. So uh, one of the important things is just because insurance companies don't require certification now doesn't mean that that can't change in the future. So, uh, you know, things change in this industry all the time. All right. And the final, that was the final certification, I'm sorry, benefit. And now share with us a little bit more about what we're seeing. It's a lot of text, apologies, but this mm -hmm. is the best way I could take it from a, uh, the California website. Yep, no, and this should actually address a couple of the questions on the on the chat over here. Sure. So there are different companies that do certifications for tiny homes. This list that Lindsay currently has on the screen is the uh, list from California Housing and Community Development that lists the companies that are allowed to work in the state of California doing certification. 
what this tells what this specific list tells you is which companies have been vetted by the state which companies have been inspected on a regular basis and that the state has made sure that we uh, comply with the per minimum personnel requirements to do what we do um, if they're listed here, they went through that process. If they are not, then it's something that you might want to ask your certifier, whether it's ICCNTA, whether it's ourselves, whether it's NOAA. The biggest difference is what type of certification are you looking for? You know, RVIA is a big one. It's not listed here, but it's because they are a an industry association. In some cases, industry associations are not recognized as certifying bodies. It doesn't mean that they are not capable of doing the, the certification process. It just means that they are not within what the state wants to do, wants to have for them to perform those certification functions. Um, for us, we are listed with the state of California. We're listed with the state of Nevada, uh, Arizona, and different other uh, jurisdictions. I also saw in the chat something about labor and industries up in Washington, and you're correct. If you are going to build or place a home up over there in within their jurisdiction, you do have to go through the process. So some states still have an oversight program for these types of certifications. When that's the case, we can guide you through the process or we can let you know exactly where to go. And I want to point out, there was a thing up above in the chat. Someone said, what's the difference of NOAA and ANSI? What's actually happening is you're blending the two. There's mm -hmm. PacWest, NOAA, and RVIA. Most people with DIY will never touch RVA. And even most new builders in the industry will never do RVA because <laughs> RVA happens to not really love that our industry is building um, homes that people are living in permanently because those both those standards are known for temporary living. So right. I get it. You can live in a tiny home full-time or people living in RVs full-time, yes. But that standard was built for temporary living. That's one of the biggest issues we've had as our industry. But do not combine the fact that RVIA is not a standard, NOAA is not a standard, and PacWest is not a standard. Right. The standard building standard is ANSI or NFPA. And then a third party would come along and say, yes, they built to this specific standard, this home. Okay, yes. so hopefully that helps everyone. It gets very confusing. RV parks are notorious for not getting this. They see the seal of the RVAA and they think that's the golden standard. Mm -hmm. That's just a certification association, mm -hmm. not the actual building standard. So there's a lot of education that you may even have to do to an RV park where you wanna bring a tiny home and say, my home is certified just like all your other homes even built better than those other homes because we're using two by four construction, but it's certified by a company you may not be as familiar with, like unlike RVIA, which has the sticker on every fifth wheel trailer, you not it, not every, because I know you guys do certify um, actual RVs. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, so and you're correct. You know, you what the thing with the with the parks and the placement is an important one. Uh, from you, Lindsay, your your experience with Russian River Parks was that they didn't know what the certification was. They weren't really aware of how that worked. Um, so once we educated them, and this is, is something that happens to people that do want to travel with their tiny homes. Once we call and explain to the park or to the management company that has that park what the certification is, what it consists of. Um, they usually will change their regulation to be able to allow for those homes to be in. And that actually brings us to the point of we have two programs, the DIY program and the manufacturer program. And it's super important to understand what you're getting as part of that, especially as a DIYer. So, uh, you know, it comes with the nine standard categories over here, the trailer, the framing, the plumbing. You know, at about the part where we got our home, all of this had already been done, but some of it had not been done correctly. So then we kind of went on from there and Alex helped us with all nine categories with those Lend limited calls and texts, which are super helpful. Product recommendations. Alex, um, unfortunately, we had made a choice about our on-demand hot water tank and we bought the wrong one, hooked it all up, used it, everything. And it was the wrong one because it wasn't built for vibration. I don't care if you drive the home five miles down the road or 15,000 miles down the road. If you have something that's not built, especially the on-demand hot water systems that are built for mobility, that will create a leak. And that's what we had to do. I had to jump up on the fridge, turn on and off every time we took a shower. And then of course we didn't have hot water. That lasted for about two months until we got the brand new one. 
So we paid twice for our, our on-demand hot water system, which is what someone never wants to hear. Um, in addition, there's three tests that you do. Three, four, there are three if you have propane. If you don't have propane, then there's two, but they both happen twice in the build. At the rough-in, pressure for water, um, for pressure for propane, and then the electrical, this dielectric test that makes sure that nothing got nicked in the build process. Um, and then Alex, what are some of the big ones that we, you know, we talk about windows, railings, a number of things that you've seen people do wrong that you help correct? So the, the big them one, avoid in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> so the big one, like you said, it's the water heater. There's a lot of propane appliances that are well built and well designed, but they don't hold a listing for RBUs, which means that when they were sent for testing to one of the laboratories like Intertech or like UL or IAPMO in the case of um, of water heaters and plumbing elements, they were not tested for the vibration and the use on the road. So uh, one of the services that we offer is we will look at the at the specific product that you're intending to use to make sure that it complies to to those requirements and it's not something that like in Lindsay's case is going to shake itself apart on the inside where you can't really see and cause an issue later on down the road. Yep. And mm -hmm. just to like have, I'm going to put it in the chat. So this is another super big one. Certification of your home is for the building standard for how the home is built. Mm -hmm. How your home travels on the road and who you certify it with, I mean register it with the DMV, those are two different entities. DMV mm -hmm. does not require certification. We've kind of gone over the benefits of certification, resale, all that, that happens within our own industry. You know, getting it permitted, all of those things, but DMV does not require certification. Correct, but but I do, wanna, I do wanna point something out on that too though, is uh, if you want to register it as an RV or as a park model, you do need to have it certified by by one of the registered agencies. Otherwise, when you go into the DMV, what I have heard from different places, because every state is different, um, one of the things that you might run into is that they will not um, register it as an RV or as a park model. They will just do it as a travel trailer, which yeah. can also create issues with your insurance. So that that's is true. Reason. And then, you know, you just described exactly our situation. We had our trailer, 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 literally the trailer part, the, what we call the chassis Then we built on top of it. And then we took it to DMV. They walked around it. Do not say how much you built the whole thing for. Only give them the information of the trailer cost, right? It's that little trick of when you sell a used car, you don't tell them you sold it for 10,000. You tell the person, I'll tell, you know, I'll tell you on the paper, I sell it for 2,000. We all know that one, right? Don't tell them, oh, I built this for 100,000 because then you're what's going to happen with your registration? Much higher. Um, just zip it when it comes to, they never asked me. If they do ask, you tell them the trailer cost. Okay, especially for all those DIYers out there. Um, you know, we like to be a little, this industry is based on renegadeness, so. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. Welcome we have to it, right? And for all of you that are like, do I get it legal or not? We're not the permit police, right? I've lived more under the radar then I lived on the radar. So anytime I've lived in an RV park, yay, legal. Anytime I lived off in a field somewhere with the, you know, compost toilet, under the radar. Um, unless you've got places where they are more open, you've got unrestricted land. Um, I'll be talking more about that tomorrow at 11. But what I love about all of this, virtual inspections. How does this all happen? Does, does Alex fly out to every DIY program out there? No, you do it virtually with the phone using Dropbox or Google, sending mm -hmm. in the videos and getting the information back so that you're going step-by-step step with him, but he's not flying out all over the country. We'd have to have 400 Alex's. <laughs> Correct. Um, so part of that- the Final two are the fire and life safety stickers and the final tag. Can you share with us more about that? Yeah, so fire and life safety considerations, we wanna make sure that you have proper egress windows on your, on your um, sleeping areas, your lofts, or your first room, um, first floor sleeping rooms. Uh, anywhere that you can sleep, you do need to have another way out besides the primary entrance door. And you will see that on all of the certified builders as well. As far as the safety stickers, uh, they're the horrible looking ones that you will get on any RV that says, please don't use the, the stove for uh, comfort heating um, or 
you know, that will point you to where to connect the water or your sewer line or, or things like that. Just those stickers are there. And then the final tag is the certification tag, that one on the first slide that Lindsay showed. That, uh, that tag lets the jurisdiction, the insurance company, or anybody that's looking for a resale that the unit has been certified, that we have looked at it and that we have found it to be safe and compliant with the codes. Okay, zoom in right along. We only got a couple minutes um, and we'll keep doing the chat and we do have a, a opportunity for you to schedule a call. So Pacific West Tiny Homes also does manufacturers. So a few people, this is some of the companies uh, that have actually gotten certified with Pacific West. Uh, this is only a, a, a smidge of how Very many they certify. <laughs> um, and this is pretty much everything included in the DIY. Yes. Um, as well as an initial, faci initial facility visit, the quality assurance manual, assistance with the manufacturing process. As someone who's watching a builder right now, go from, you know, a lot of people go from building homes to something like that on um, tiny homes. It takes a minute to learn different processes. And then on-site visits for 10% of the builds. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we are required to look at some of the, at the homes that are being built, both, um, on site and as they are being built. So we will help the uh, a manufacturer create a quality assurance program and a manual so that we can keep track of everything that they're doing. And it also helps them avoid liability and keep records for the rest of the, the rest of the time that they are building tiny homes. And then now offering in 2023 HUD certification for California and Nevada, which is very exciting. Uh, I know there was a mention up above about HUD uh, that is your national building standard. And of course, here we go. Here's uh, Alex's information is here. And then this QR code gets to me. Um, I actually am an affiliate with Pacific West. So when you purchase through me, you also get my time in addition to all that you get with Alex. Yes. Yay. And then I'll put that in the chat as well. And we have one minute. <laughs> <laughs> Very wow. little for Q and A, but I do welcome calls and text at that number. So any questions that ever come up, please always feel free to call or text. Um, but yeah, I mean, we okay, I, I do enjoy I do enjoy seeing people from from all over the the U.S. and other places coming in and doing um doing these types of events. We do look forward to the next one as well. And if you're in California and able to head to Fresno to the Tiny Home Show, we will see you there too. Okay, they were just asking for the number yeah. again. Let me hit share. Um, actually, if you could just type it in the chat, so it was not on it with my, whew, 30 minutes. Okay, there we go. 816-716-6271. Get mm -hmm. your certification on uh, make sure your builder manufacturer is certified. Probably the most important thing we could share today. Absolutely. Thanks, everyone. I know we got some amazing speakers going on. I'll be I'll be joining with uh, Jay Schaefer later on today, as well as uh, speaking tomorrow at eleven, and then supporting uh, Dan Fitzpatrick and Brad Wiseman with the Tiny Home Industry Association, which Alex and I are both members of, and Alex is on the board of, and mm -hmm. really talking about the new ICC. Uh, collaboration with Thea, and that's a whole opportunity for making tiny homes possible all over the country. Yes, if you do have the time to attend that one, please do. It's going to be really informational, and I think that is part of the future that we have to look forward to with tiny homes. Yeah, it's only taken us a few years. Just a few. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, everyone. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. Two days. Woohoo! Go tinyhouse.com. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Tiny House Conference.